And yeah, and so so we've been we've been we've been kind of defining a lot of things when it comes to to do with law. What is the law? Um, you know, uh, you know, is the law important? You know, should we get rid of it altogether? Should we ignore it? Um, should we obey anything? If you say that you want to celebrate, um, you know, I don't know, the Jewish New Year, are you a legalist? Should you be banned? If you don't celebrate it, you know, is that, is that bad? Do you know what I mean, what's the difference between then and now, ETC, ETC? And we've kind of tried to merge a lot of ideas and you know, break down a few things just so we can understand that the law or living under the law, and this is not my, what I want to talk about, but just, just to kind of preface, living under the law is actually more a mentality than it is actions. Are we, are we together? You, you, sometimes when you preach a message, law and grace, people are like, oh my God, I'm living under the law. I'm not going to pray in the morning anymore. I'm just going to flow. I'm just going to pray. You know, I'll just, I'll just flow. Oh my God, I, I don't want to sing before I pray. Oh, I, don't, I just want to just... I'm just going to like stop everything that looks like procedural, everything that is orderly, because that's law, you know. In grace, you know, with, unfortunately, sometimes, ah, uh, you know, group, we can sometimes be like, you know, grace just means just flow. Everybody just say flow. So you just do what you like. And so if you're doing something right now, and I, if you, you know, someone ran up and grabbed the mic from me and said, you know, Angelo, I have a word, and I just need to say it now, you know, people would say, oh, Angelo, just let him flow. Because you don't want to be under the law. Grace just means free to flow. But, but we know that's not what it means. Okay? Yes, you are free in every way. You don't have to sing two songs, you know, before you pray, or you don't have to start your prayer with, um, in the precious, glorious, beautiful name of Jesus, or whatever you learned in your primary school, or whatever. You don't, you don't have to say all these things, or whatever it is, but it doesn't mean that God does not have intention, order, plans, and we see that clearly in the New Testament. Although they were free, they were actually very regimented, okay? There is no army on the earth that they just say, hi, guys, welcome to training. Um, just flow. When we get to the war, you see the people, just do what you want. If you want to shoot, shoot. If you want to just pray, pray. Just let the Lord, you know, let the wind lead you or whatever. No. Okay? There are instructions. How many of you know that God is intentional? And if God is intentional, it means that he gives intentional instructions. He give, gives intentional stuff. He says to people, this is what I want you to do. This is what is happening at this time and that time and that time. And so, generally speaking, we've been trying to get that going, you know, give kind of a background of that. And I think we've learned quite a lot. By the way, if you sleep, I will personally pour water on your face. I'm seeing some eyes like, when, you, when we're saying when we call, no, no, what? <laughs> someone's offering me. When we're saying when we call you on him, you were like, Glory, uh, time for the word. You just, you're praying. No, no. If you're tired, stand up. Find someone with gum, chew the gum. If you sleep, I promise you, I will call you out. Promise, promise, <laughs> promise. God knows, I'll call you out. Okay? And, you know, we're not that big yet, so I can actually call you out freely. So, and it's going to be on the periscope as well. So, everyone that watches it forever will just know that on this day, John slept while the message was going on, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, I pray as, as I share your word and what you have to say, Father, give wisdom, give understanding. Father, I pray that it will go according to your will, Father. Educate us, prepare us, Father, and get us ready for what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you're a title person, I want to talk to you about a title, you know, what I titled, The Promise Versus the Present. The Promise Versus the Present. The Promise Versus the Present. And I'll use, I'll, I'll talk from Galatians, that's what, what, what we've been kind of doing a study on, and I'll connect, um, you know, Galatians, and we'll, we'll look at it in Genesis, and kind of see how, you know, that makes sense in terms of what, what is the difference, or what is the struggle, and you see it while, while we study, what is the struggle that sometimes happens between the present and the promise. Have you ever felt like you're in the middle ground where, and it'll make more sense, but 
where you're in a place right now which is not too bad. But when you pray, you're starting to get this discomfort about your, your particular location. And you don't even want to feel bad about where you are. Is there anyone here who's, who has gone into prayer or gone into whatever, and you have this dissatisfaction about remaining where you are, and you don't even want to feel bad about it? You, you come out and you're thinking, oh my God, what's wrong? Like, yeah, he's felt it too, even though he hasn't had a year, you know, about a year or year, but he's felt it. But, but, you see, in every single one of our lives, we are almost always in a wrestle between where we are and where we're going to. If you're honest, and if you really have a heart to follow God and his will, that is a wrestle you will never get out of. It's, it's, it's taking me a little while, but every, even tomorrow, I'm like, God, can I just get a moment without having a purpose? I just want to have a moment where I can just park my car and just be here for 20 minutes and just feel like there's nothing else but where I am right now. And sometimes, actually, you can be tortured by the calling of God. And the thing that God is asking you to do, it, it, it is so great. It is grand. And when you tell people, they're like, oh, my God. I, you know, people, on your birthday, people send you a message. They say, listen, I'm so happy for you. And they come and add another prophetic word to the 500 that you already have. And you don't even know what to do with the ones you have. And you're tired of hearing God say, I'm sending you here. And I want you to be this. And tomorrow and next week. And they keep adding. And I'm a corporate. I will always do that. I'll call you on your birthday. And I'll tell you some more. Do you know what I mean? And you, you have these people that you know, you see the coin, you're like, I don't even want, I don't want to talk to this person because I feel like they're going to give me a duty and I'm tired. Anyone ever felt like that? You ever felt like you just want to stay? God, just thank you for your word, but let me just rest in you. And you know, you know, sometimes you feel that resting in God is just doing nothing for a little bit. Just, God, I just want to rest in you. Is, anyone, is it just me? Or does anyone, when, 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 when someone's praying for you and they say, God is calling you to rest, does anyone kind of like see like a field of like pillows or, or cutting and you're just like laying? And you know, you're just kind of drowsy and you're doing nothing else. And, and, and you leave that service after someone has told you you're going to rest in God. And they say just take seven days and just be with the Lord and he will give you rest. And you're in the sixth day. And you have a list of things that you need to do after the seventh day. You're saying, God, where is my rest? It is the wrestle between the promise and the present. And if we don't understand why these things are happening or put within context the reason why God has to put this pressure on you, what would happen is that you would become so frustrated that you would quit the promise and live in the present. You are not meant to live in the present and quit the promise. But you're also not meant to live in the promise and forget the present. You see, I've done the thing where I was so promise focused that I stopped taking care of who I am in today. And when you say, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm just going forward. Angela, what are you eating today? The future is mine. Man shall not live by bread alone. Have you eaten last week? Man shall not live. I'm going the preceding word. I'm just, I just want to eat the word. And, and, you know, by the sixth day, I'm struggling. I am weak, tired. I have no energy. I have not slept. But I'm chasing the promise. But I've forgotten the present. You see, the thing about God is that, you know God, we say that God is omnipresent everywhere at the same time. Have you ever wondered that if you were created in the image of God, that God is trying to conform you to a kind of person who can live in the present, the future, and the past at the same time? Where you no longer have to cut out a part of your life in order to live today. You can say, listen, this is who I was, this is who I am, this is who I'm going to be, and we're all together. And people say, you know, I, you know I, I want you to just forget the past. All things are past. For, but you need to understand, when he says all things are passed away, he doesn't mean forget the past. Because Jesus, in his whole ministry, spent a majority of his ministry referring to the past. In fact, his ministry was to actually deal with the past. And so how could he deal with the past if he was, not, was going to forget about the past? 
And so when he says old things are passed away, what he's talking about is the effect, the negative effect of those things on you, the, 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 the condemnation like Glory spoke about, the fear, all of those things that hold you down. He's saying, listen, put those things away. All things, he didn't say just the future becomes new, everything, which means the perspective on your past is new, the perspective on the failures are new, everything in your life becomes new. And so I don't have to say to hell with my family, to hell with this, I'm to hell with the present, I'm just going forward. Everything in my perspective can become new, and so I can live in three different dimensions at the same time and still fulfill the calling of God. And so let's have a look at Galatians chapter 4. Let me introduce quickly and then we'll get into it. Galatians 4. Let me get the verse up. Boy, I'm a bit winded here. Whew. I'm like, I need to go to the gym, man. Yeah, Galatians 4. Um, I think it's, let me check. Um, let's go to, I don't want to, don't want to labor for so many things so we can just kind of get to the point. Um, <clears throat> let's go to 21. 21. Galatians chapter 4. Sorry. Um, I completely was in my bedroom there. <laughs> I just completely forgot about you guys. Um, so, yeah, hello, hi. Um, whoa. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> Jesus. Um, yeah. Okay. You know what? Let's, let, let's just do it from 21. Let me not um, go around too much. Okay. So, <clears throat> this NKJV, is it? I, I think. Yeah, I, I, it is, it is. Okay. So it says this. It says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Everybody say two sons. The one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. Keep that in mind. Bondwoman and free woman. Okay, it says, but he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Everybody say flesh. And he of the free woman through promise, a promise, promise, which things are symbolic. For, there are, for these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Hagar is the bondwoman, okay? For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above... I want you to keep this in mind. He used Jerusalem for both ex explanations. Same name, different locations. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of, of us all. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has, ma has many more children than he who has a husband. That's good. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. One second. I want to keep note of this thing. Okay, thank you. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? This part was strong. It says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. Can you imagine saying this today? There's no agency that will not come for you. NHS is going to be on you, politicians, the government. They will literally use you to shift the perspective from Brexit. Everyone's going to be talking about you. Imagine if you say someone to cast out the woman and her son. Get out. So vile, but so key. And Abraham did it, so it must be okay. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son. Shall not be heir. Shall not receive the inheritance with the son of the free woman. Jerusalem versus Jerusalem. Different locations, but they can't share. Okay, next verse. So then, brethren... 
We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Is that the last one? Oh, is this Romans 3? I was like, I didn't say this one in Galatians the last time I read. <laughs> but I'm going to say it like it was there because I'm preaching now, so I can't. I'm like, yeah, but hallelujah, you know, just, just put it there. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so but the last thing he says is, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Let's, let's have a look at um, um, Genesis chapter 21. And so while he's going there, 21, towards the end, let me, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get it for you. So but while he's going to Genesis 21, Paul was describing <clears throat> two covenants. He was talking about living under the law versus living under the grace of God. And one of the first things I told you to keep note of is that Paul referred to both covenants as Jerusalem. Everybody say Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I don't know the meaning in this situation, but, but they were both referred to by the same name, which means that they had something similar about both of them. You see, one of the things about grace versus law is that the reason why when we discuss this stuff that you kind of go on for three months or two months or whatever and then you find yourself living in law again is because they're actually very similar they're very close they look very much alike it's like but i'm still praising um, you see, what you mean, you, he was talking about Ishmael versus Isaac, and we'll look at it in Genesis. But one thing you need to realize about the two sons, everybody knows that, well, not assuming, but Abraham had, was meant to have a son of promise by his wife, Sarah, okay? But he was impatient, we'll get to that, and he lay with um, Hagar and gave birth to Ishmael. Later on, he, Sarah still conceived, and his, Isaac was born. Isaac was promised. Um, what's his name? Ishmael was not, okay? Now, one thing to notice there is this. They were both boys. I, I wish Ishmael was a girl because maybe we could have started to say that it was an olden time and maybe because she was a woman, she could not receive the inheritance. And We could have tried to create a revelation out of it to say that maybe God sent them a girl so that she wouldn't. We could, we could have made something out of it, but God made sure that they were both boys, Male children. And back there, because of the paternalistic nature, the boy, the man, was just, you know, it, it was just all about him. The woman was just second class to nothing. Okay, now, mostly that's how Abraham treated Sarah, because he really did respect Sarah. But back then, in the general culture, it was heavily paternalistic. And still is, to an extent, now. But the thing to realize, they were both boys. They both ate food, played games, and we don't even know who looked more like Abraham. We weren't given the explanation of how they looked. We just told they were boys. You see, it's possible that Ishmael may have looked more like his dad. He may have been more of a carbon copy that when he was born, they would have said, ah, dad's child has come. Oh, finally, the one who would represent. They would have placed all these accolades on him and all of this stuff, but he was not the promise. And we're going to see something in a minute. And Paul said, cast out, the, you see that in Genesis, that Sarah said, cast out this bond woman and her son because she cannot share an inheritance with the promise. You see, where I'm edging to is this, and I'll read it in a second. It doesn't matter how similar or how emotionally attached or whatever it is, the present or the other thing or whatever it is that you know you do, you have, whatever it is, as long as it does not have the seal of the promise, it has no validity to God. None. Cast out the bondwoman. And I don't want to say too much. Let me read Genesis. Genesis 21. Um, let's go all the way down to, uh, I think it's verse 12, but, but, or verse 8. I think it's 8. Yeah, Genesis 21, verse 8, I believe. Let me open it, though. Yeah, it is 8, yeah. Okay, good. So, it says... 
This is Isaac was born, okay? I'll give you a slight timeline, but I don't want to waste too much time on context. The message is actually very short, but, but I'll just give, give you context and hit it in the, in, in the belly, okay? So, so the child grew, this is Isaac. So the child grew, the son of promise. I don't want to read the context, but this is Isaac that was born out of Abraham's original wife, the, the one he has married, Sarah, the woman that was given the promise of having the son at old age. Um, FYI, Abraham was 99 here. I believe um, Sarah was 10 years younger than him. So he was about 100, okay, and Sarah was 90. It was impossible. Her womb has literally somersaulted, closed up. It's just dust now. There's nothing there. But somehow the child was in there. He somehow stretched. She somehow had a baby bump. I don't know how her spine at 90 carried a baby bump. We, you see, the miracle in this story is ridiculous, but you read it like a tale, and that's why it doesn't impact you. You read it like it's a story that someone thought about. No, no. You need to understand that this woman was 90 years old. She, everything in her body had, be, had not begun to fail. It starts fading probably around 50. It, it was done. It was tired. I don't even know why they were still asking for children. Like, she was done. She had nothing left in her. Weak. And she's carrying a baby that was a couple pounds for nine months at 90. When you look at God and you, I just side note, when you look at God and you say, God, I just can't. I'm like, Sarah. There is so much history in the Bible of people who can't but did. You see, let me tell you something just to encourage you. You are in the company of a lot of people who can't. Don't you see sometimes in this thing the enemy tries to make you feel isolated or you feel like you're in your own world and it's all about you and your story is different. No one gets you and you just can't and you start to go inner and inner and inner and you get too far in your emotions. But you need to realize that you are in the company of a lot of people who actually can't. I can't. I don't, sometimes I wake up, I'm, I don't even know what I'm doing. Halfway through this, someone's like asking me questions. Literally, I am winging. Have you ever winged something so much that you even winged your wing? You, you literally, like, you, you were winging it so much that you started to, like, like you, you have someone to tell you, okay, like, chill. You've, you've done enough. Sometimes that's the day for me. Because there's moments where I realize that, pff, bro, I cannot. But you've got to understand that God called Abraham when they got to the stage where they could not. God had 75 years to call him. He could have called him at 20, 30. He was, he was still in his father's house. There was, he was a man. He was already working. Abraham was rich, alone, chilling. He had money. He was fine when God called him. Why wait till he can't? Because the grace that God wants to reveal through you is a grace that you can't do. You cannot produce it. 90 years old. So the child grew and was weaned. This is Isaac. And Abraham made, I, I feel for him, he made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. When Isaac started eating solid food, that's what weaning generally means, um, or, or food that was not just breast milk. Okay, so, and Sarah saw the son, I don't know why I explained that, it's not necessary. But anyway, so, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. So the son, the former son, the one, you know, the, the Ishmael guy that was born, he was about, he, he was born about 86, so he was about 13 years old at this point. And Sarah, trust mothers to see someone scoffing at their child. Only a mom can see that. The dad was literally just doing his own thing, creating the feast. The boy was probably pointing and scoffing. He was just like, ah, look at this. Walking past, the mom is just there. She's just doing her, she's, she's not even seeing, but she just feels it. Someone is scoffing. At my child, and she's looking. I don't know what happens with moms, but listen, everybody here, listen to women in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out. Now, this was a husband. Now, you need to understand that the book of 1 Peter 3 says that, yeah, 1 Peter 3 says that Sarah called Abraham Lord. This was not normal. It was a breach of protocol. You see, this woman, this man carried her son to go and kill him. And she didn't say cast, cast. She didn't, she, he has done too much. 
that you would have expected her reaction. Why is it that in this particular story, Sarah was so upset, so offended, that she had to speak to her Lord, husband. I know some of you be like, call my husband Lord, I rebuke you. But this is how they used to do it. She had to look to her Lord, her husband, and tell him. She didn't ask him, honey, would you mind? Would it be okay? What are your thoughts about? She looked at him and said, cast out this bondwoman or slave and her son. And this was her reason. She said, for the son of this slave or bondwoman shall not be heir with my son named Isaac. Her reason for the offense, for the, 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 the whatever that she put into that, was that she realized that there was inheritance that was available and it could not be shared. There was something that was a plan from God that God had set for your life before the foundations of this world that he had said, you will do this. And, and she got to a point where she realized that I cannot be too nice with this one. You see, we got to get rid of a spirit of niceness where we become so weak to the point where we can't confront something that is coming in direct opposition to the plans of God in our life. Sarah was so rest- I'm not saying you should be rude before you come to me tomorrow and say, Angelo, I cast you out of this place. You know, if I offend you, please just have mercy. But Sarah, in the midst of all this stuff going on, her son was just being weaned. She saw a 13-year-old boy scoffing at her son. Now, you need to understand, a 13-year-old boy doesn't know too much, and she knows that. She understands that he may just be playing, he may just be being silly, but something was revealed to Esther in the spirit that we are not, we are not seeing on the paper, that when she saw him scuffing, inheritance came to her mind. How did Sarah take a 13-year-old scuffing boy and relate it to inheritance? You see, where your eye, you see, Paul says this in Ephesians, he said, set your eyes on things above. You see, when your eyes are set on things above, everything gives a significance to you. You can see some random, rubbish, regular thing happening, and you're like, mm, 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 no, no. You see, the reason why sometimes we allow a lot of things into our, our, our space that we have not vetted is because we're, our eyes are not set above. When you go to the airport, you can wear heels, flats, no shoes. It does not matter what you wear. You will still walk through the scanners. Because they've set their eyes on the worst possible person that could be coming to the airport to cause the biggest problem. Their eyes are above. It's not about you, but they have made a decision. We will not have a calamity because we have seen this before. We have been past this road. It will not repeat. So set your eyes on things above. Someone say set. So when people say fast and pray and all this stuff, we can make it an amusement park. We can make it feel like, oh, you know, oh, it's, just, it's not all about that. Great, this is grace and, and whatever it is. But Paul uses analogy, and he said cast. It was an intentional thing. Her eyes were set in such a way where when she saw the boy, she realized that it was worse than the boy. You see, if she saw the slave scoffing at her son, you would have thought, oh, okay, you know, it would have been more explainable why, you know, woman to woman, let me not go there. But why she would have seen the, the other lady scoffing at her boy and would have said, look, look at this girl, she's doing this, whatever, whatever, and she would have tried. But she saw a child. What things in your life currently do you consider children that don't need to be vetted? What part of your life right now doesn't have a check on it? Because it's not a big deal. It can't do me no harm. Let me tell you something. The enemy is not coming for what you think he's coming for. I don't want to, I don't know how to explain this to you. He's not coming for the, the lust that you feel you've been struggling with or the, the uh, you know, the, the, the stealing or the lying and the big stuff. He, he wants to get you so caught up in the big stuff. So caught up in the things happening, the noise, the, oh my God, this is happening. You see, and that's the problem. You see, with business people, when there's a big change in the economy, you're, you're all shouting, Brexit, oh, oh my God, all this stuff. The people who are trying to make money are not listening. You see, let me tell you something. Something my mentor said to me before, he said, listen, when it gets to the newspaper, it's too late. When it, becomes on, when it comes on BBC, you're late. 
If you see the stocks on CNN and they're saying, oh my God, Alibaba is going up, you are too late. The people who are getting the most money out of it invested when no one even knew that it was going to happen. When you have foresight, you have the ability to see beyond something that is right in your face. And when someone is building something that will last long, you're not just thinking about tomorrow. You're thinking, God, tell me something. What is standing in the way of years and decades to come? I need to build for legacy and not just for food on my plate. I told someone, I said, I said, you guys, I said, guys, you're still focusing on school fees and food on your plate. No, 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 no. Move past that. Let's get to a place where we're trying to talk about conversations where we don't have the money for it, but we're talking about it. You see, these boys were 13 and less than one. There was no talk of inheritance. Abraham wasn't trying to die. They were babies. Even if the inheritance was given, they both would not have known what to do with it. But Sarah had foresight. So if you're a danger person, when it happens, then you pray, the church, sometimes. Earthquake. Guys, hashtag this place. This happens, oh my God, hashtag Sudan. Change all your pictures to blue. Let's go for it now. I'm not taking the mic. Listen, I'm not saying that these things aren't happening and we shouldn't pray about them. But what I'm saying is that we're going to have to have foresight. So we stop doing cleaning up the mess when it's already messed up. You see, if this woman sat down quiet, these boys would have grown up. And when it came to the time where she said, cast out this boy, this woman and the son, um, Ishmael would have been 30 years old. And he would have said, cast who out? Who you, have you ever watched them Nigerian movies? He would have said, who are you, gonna, who are you casting? Who are you going to kick out? This is my father's house. Blah, blah, blah. And he would, have, he would have gone this complex. He would have been too big that it would have been difficult, difficult to cast him out. When he was 13, he was young. He could not have done anything. This was a man with so many people fighting for him. When he said cast out, he had to leave because it was the right time. Everybody say time. Sorry, not angry at you. So... Next verse, please. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Let me tell you something. You know, I started talking to you about, have you ever been in two places at the same time where you're in the present and you're struggling with the future? You see, I like this story because this story is often always looked at from the perspective of God. And so when you look at God, you're thinking, you know, Abraham, you know, yeah, go kill your son. Yeah, Ovi, God told him and he just did it. Have you ever tried to look at the Bible through the place, through the perspective of the person receiving the instruction? We should play a game, think like Abraham. Think like Ezekiel. Think like Hosea. Think like David. It's a good game to play. If you play a game, think like these people, you would start to see what was going on in Abraham's mind. Let me tell you something. Abraham had been looking for a son for 86 years. And finally, he got a son. And man, if God was going to, I mean, come on. Some of you have siblings, you have friends. It's deeper when they're your child. There's, 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 there's something about it that you cannot explain. Whenever people have a child, they often say, I, could not, I can't explain the kind of love that I have. It is beyond explaining. There's nothing you could, even if your parents say, your mom says, get out, whatever. It's, there is something in her that she cannot explain. Your dad, he cannot explain the, the love, whether he's realized it or not. But there is something about the love of a parent, much less, or more, more, more even Abraham, who trained his son closely. He had a son, finally, <clears throat> at 86. And Abraham... God allowed Abraham to train him for 13 years. One, three. If I, I can't if you calculate the number of days that is. It is time after time. 10 years alone is like 3,500 and something days. With one person. Every day he saw him. He said, son, do this. Pick up my shoes or my sandals or whatever they wore. You know, clean the horse. You know, he, he, he talked to him. He trained him. He had plans for him. 
Have you ever had something that you were building for so long and you had plans? You're, has, has God ever changed your trajectory when you didn't expect it? You have been telling everyone, I'm going to be a businesswoman. I'm going to do this. You see, the thing about submission is not that you don't know, but is that whenever God says time is up, you're willing to say, God, I have done 10 years of investment, but you know what? Thank you very much for your time. I'm on my way. Think about it. If you were building something, even a company, for 20 years and God came at a random time and he said, um, excuse me, um, um, time is up now. You can go. What happens? That's why we see a lot of organizations are not moving forward because they have exceeded their time. Every good CEO or head of a board knows when the CEO's time has expired. They know when you can't go any further. We'll fire you. And they're willing to pay millions in a severance package to fire somebody that they feel their time has expired. What is the cost for you to walk away from something that has expired? You see, and this is where law and grace comes in. Because now, when we realize that, oh my God, I have trained my son like Abraham for 13 years. Everybody says that, oh, Abraham had to kill Isaac. Yeah. You see, let me tell you something. The reason why Abraham had even the confidence to kill Isaac is because he had already sent away a son. This was not the first child he lost. Listen, you need to understand, this was the second child that Abraham was losing. It wasn't his first rodeo. He had heard God say, before kick away your son and so this time he said God if you did it before and Isaac came and we got the son you can do it again so when he was saying listen I know that God will raise him up I know that God he wasn't talking from nothing he was saying I have seen a son go and another come it is possible if my wife could give birth at 90 and me being 100 I know that God will do it again but what we can tend to do is then live in this place, and we start to slip away from grace, where we live like we say, God, I like where you're sending me, and it looks good, but I think we can all go there together. What I'm doing now is not bad. You see, and we've reduced the instructions of God. I, remember, the first thing I told you is this, is that within um, grace that there are instructions. What I'm highlighting to you is that the fact that we say grace does not mean no sacrifice. Because sometimes you, when you're going through a long journey and a tough space, you're thinking, why isn't grace working for you? But let me tell you something. Grace doesn't only work when you're out and you're glorious and whatever it is. Grace works when you are in the valley of the shadow of death and you're alone. That's where grace is activated. It is, it's locating you for when you can't do. And what we're talking about here is that even in the midst of Abraham's suffering and he's come out, he's left his father's house at 75. This is literally 25 years later. He has done everything that God asked. And he says to him, part away with the thing that is most important to you. Do you know that you can be a hindrance to the grace of God on your life? Because you've tried to share the grace of God between something that is the promise and something that's not the promise. You said, God, this is what you want me to do. That's good. But if I can just share my time between this calling and this thing that's good. God, you can see the fruit. You can see what, you know, what's happening. God, you, you're not blind. You, look at the good work. People are getting saved, Jesus. And he's saying, no, no, shut down that ministry. It's time for you to go and do nothing. And he's saying, God, but come on, think about it, God. A 13-year-old boy who has grown past babyhood, his, his chances of getting any kind of opportunistic sicknesses have reduced so drastically. And now you want me to keep one that's less than one? What if he doesn't make it as much as this word? What if something happens? Father, I've seen this one to maturity. He can talk now. I don't need to follow him around on the walker anymore. He's not going to walk into a fire. He's not going to put his hand on electricity. I have trained this one to a stage where he can stand by himself. So God, it makes sense to keep Ishmael as well as Isaac. When you read this story, you need to realize it made sense to keep Ishmael. It wasn't a stupid decision. I think it was even more crazy to get rid of him. You train the son, take your inheritance. One finally grows halfway there and you kick him out. Makes no sense. But the thing about the grace of God is that the grace of God, put this down, it has an allocation. Everybody say allocation. Okay. Let, me, let, let, me, let me get you the verse. I can't skip my mind. It says that to every, God has given us, uh, I'm not really saying much, but let me find it. It's given a measure of grace. <clears throat> Glory. Um, it's 
So I need to get you this verse so we can see it. Yeah, yeah. So it's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Now <clears throat> to each one, now unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. There is grace that has been allocated and apportioned for the thing that you were called to do. And it is not in your power to tell God, God, I have energy enough to do both. And so now, I just, God, don't worry about me. The grace you've given me is enough for the two. Because this is the problem. When you do more than you're called to do, although you can do it, although you can accomplish it, you will always get mediocre standards across all of them. I always talk about the seed that actually fell into the ground and grew. And it says that there was a 30 harvest, there was a 60% harvest, and then there was a 100% harvest. All a harvest. But someone or some harvest just did not meet the mark. And so Paul says, he says, I press towards what? The mark. There is a height that you are meant to reach. You see, don't settle for, I'm just doing what God called. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the vicinity. I'm in the space. Uh, I'm just doing what God has called me to do. I'm, uh, don't worry about it. Like, I, I, God's been pushing you. Press start, business, start, business, start, business. Do this, do this. You finally started it. So now you're like, you're cool. You're like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. It doesn't matter how it's going. You're like, God has sent me here. And so God, now that I've gotten into the door, I don't need you no more. I'm now going to figure out how I go. You see, let me tell you something. The Bible says a man plans his way and God orders his word. Steps. When God gives you a plan, you take it and you write it down, you make the vision plain, whatever. And now you have gone into the door. That's actually when you need God even more. You need to draw nearer. You see, every time that you receive a measure of grace and you feel, oh my God, God, I have this more to steward this. Your reaction is, Father, more, closer closer. Take me deeper. Take me deeper. You see, Moses started with the burning, the burning bush. At some point, he was just in the mountain. He was just there for days. The burning bush experience was quick. That was the initiation. When he was in the heat of the problem, of the thing, of the purpose, he was now going for more days. Why? It's a principle. I don't step away from God because now I'm in the door. I'm not less obedient to God because I've passed through the door. I am seeking his voice daily because the door is just the initiation. Say initiation. initiation. Now let's go back to Genesis 21. I'm coming to, I'm coming to, a, to an end. <clears throat> I'll give you some uh, points. It's very, I have given quite a few points. So. But I'll give some more points and then I won't close. So Genesis 21... Um, I think we were on nine somewhere. So if you go there, I'll have a look. Yeah, so a bit more. Ten, eleven. Yes, good. And the matter was displeasing in Abraham's sight. Why? Because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of the bondwoman. This conversation sounds so calm and so relaxed. We can imagine Abraham hearing it. Get rid of your son. But it's okay, don't worry about it. Can you imagine? 13 years, investing is cool. Just kick him out, Abraham. Don't worry, it's all going to be okay. He was talking to Abraham at a level of maturity that God could speak to him in a certain way. He said, Abraham, don't worry. You're good. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. And this is the reason. He said, for in Isaac, your seed shall be called. In Isaac, your seed shall be called. Next verse. And he says this. And we'll hit this point very quickly. He says, yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman. Because he is your seed. Next verse. So Abraham, we'll get there. Stop at 13. I just spoke to you about this a second ago, but you ever, God ever spoken to you and said, hey, leave this thing 
and your initial and immediate thought is, immediate thought is this, God, who's going to do it? God, I've been doing this for so long. I know it so well. This is everything. I'm, you, oh, God, this is like my whole life. Like, this is my baby. It's my thing. God says, it's time to move. But the thing that holds you back is actually that you're overzealous for what God has moved off from. You remember the stress when God pressed you and said, open it, start it, do it, get it going, whatever it is. And finally, you started it, and now you remain. So when God says, time up, you're saying, Father, let me just work with it, God. I don't think anyone could. God, what are you going to do with them? And you feel as though it's pride, because you feel as though if you're not there, it will not go forward. You have concluded in your mind that you're the only one God can use. You're the only, and that's why the, so a lot of businesses are so s- small and they're crunching and they're slowing down and, and ministries and whatever it is, is because there's only one person that can be used or, or three people that can be used. And, and so when you decide to start a business, rather than saying, Father, send people. You see, the first thing Jesus did before he started his journey is that he went around to find his people. You see, the problem is this. We do business upside down. When God says go, the first thing you do is to find your process, the this, the that, the this, the that. You start to build and do all these things alone and now there's too much that you're so confused you don't even know what to give out and then you start to look for people and then now you're paranoid because you're like god i don't know are they here for the money are they here for me blah, 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 blah. when you when god says go he's got people for you and you may not find them in the beginning you may not locate the people but god has people in his heart and so your prayer is father Help me to see the ones that you have attached to the calling on my life. The reason you're so weighed down is because when you see the calling, the only person you see in the vision is yourself. And you can't think of any other person. Every time you're seeing a vision of yourself, what do you think God is going to do? He's going to show you a vision of yourself. But he expects that your initiative would know that you can't be the only one there. He says, I will make him a great nation. I will still work in Ishmael, although he's left you. Because if you meet any parent, there's a relationship with the children. That's their biggest burden. Who's going to take care of him if I'm gone? Where is he? Is he? Has he crawled? What is he doing? Because Abraham had a genuine burden for the well-being of his son. Not even just for the comfort or the pleasure of his son being around, but for the well-being of his son. But God said, listen, I've got him. And so when God says to you, listen, I know you're the deliverer of your family. And you're the deliverer of your church. And you're the deliverer of, of everything in, in your way. And he says, listen, son, that's good. All that you're doing is good work. But it's time to move on. Why don't you do this? And now in your prayer life, you know where God is going. You can sense it in your heart. But you quench the spirit to pray what you're used to. You'd rather silence God to get your paper out. And I'm not saying you should have a list of things to pray for. Don't get me wrong. Have it. Pray for it. All those things are good. But when the Lord is speaking, that's why you give no time to God, because you filled your whole prayer time with the things that you used to do. It has been seven whole years. Tarry long. Don't lose hope. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. There comes a point where you ask God, God, what are you saying now? Have you been talking or have you stopped? It's funny because we have the Holy Spirit inside us. And we're acting, the prophets back then would go to inquire from God. They were literally disturbing God. Jeremiah says, leave him, make him no rest until he answers. But we have the Spirit of God walking around the place. We don't even have to go to anywhere. But we're not asking God questions. What are you saying, God? You're asking for grace. God, release grace. Release grace. And he's looking at you saying, where? What? What? What is the capacity? Have you, have you started thinking about the people that are going to be around you that he's now sending grace for you to lead them, for you to attract them? You, 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 you're not in the right location. David had to go to the war front for grace to come upon him to kill Goliath. And so if your location or posture is not right, the grace is just going to be hovering over your head. And every day you'll be saying, Father, release it. Release it. But let me tell you something. God responds to prayers when you're postured. It's not just about talking. You can talk from now to forever. When you're asking God for something, he checks your posture. That's a king. How can you come and say, Angelo, I want this gift, and your hands are like that? 
Have you ever gone to the bartender, bartender or the whatever, or the fountain? You just gone there. You want water. And you just go there. You press it and just put your hand under like that. Not even like a cup. Just flatten it out and try to drink. It's madness. But we often do that with grace because we see grace as something that we can just waste. God has allocated a measure. He has thought about what you would need and he has already sent it. Your posture might be the thing standing in your way of receiving grace. And so, the next thing. Now, and this is the last, this is, you know, the last major part. He says this, he says, Abraham rose, somebody read that for me, he says, early, right? Early in the morning to kick his son out of the house. I don't know about you, but I'd have had a lion to digest, to think about it. You see, let me tell you something. Sometimes the reason why you can no longer do what God has said is because you've become comfortable. You just waited. God says, do this. When you're hot and ready, you'll be like, God, let me just see how it goes. Two days, three days. Now they come and say, oh, didn't God say you to do this? Oh, oh, I know you've had all these discouragements and all these thoughts and you had 700 conversations and okay, um, and I'm not saying that there's no space for timing and counsel because there's time to know, okay, God, I heard this, but I now need to go and seek counsel in order to work this out because I need people. But there's a difference between when God gives you an instruction and now you have delayed obedience and grace is there. And you've, when God said it to you, you said, Father, give me the grace to work it out. And God said, release, it's there. And now it's literally there on your bed waiting for you to just wake up so you can have the boldness. What kind of courage will a man grab his son with a knife and be walking to the mountain for a lo- hours and hours and hours, a long journey with his son? There's a knife in the pocket and he's just like, hi, son, you're right. You see, you have grace to even endure the journey that you're going through. But when you sit down, lay down, lazy up, waiting for the grace to hit you, pick you up, move your legs and walk you to it, you mock God. We need to get up and go and let the Lord then lead us. God will send you, get up, go, and then let him carry you. What's that song? He will carry something. Okay. I'm trying to sing one that you know so you can help me out. But anyways, so Abraham rose early. He gave them food. And then they left. Next verse. I think that's, that's the last one for me. Yes, that's okay. That's okay. The rest of it, we see that God actually took care of Ishmael and the slave Hagar as he promised that he would. We can read that in your own time. Okay. So we've dealt with a few things. And the concept we were handling was the promise versus the present. Is I have a goal, I have a future, God has a plan for me. But man, it seems like there's a long way between where I am and there. And how can I let go of what I can see for what I can't really see? God, how can I stop this and not do that and what it is? And yeah, it's great all in world that I can believe you. But what if it doesn't? Has anyone asked themselves, what if? What if it doesn't happen? What if it wasn't God? What if? God, but maybe. And the problem is that if God says to you, you'll be great, you don't ask, mm, maybe, what if? What if? When, when God says certain things to you that you like in your flesh, you're very happy to say, amen, hallelujah, let's go, send him, Lord. Yeah. But when God says something to you that, that pricks your flesh, then you fall into all kinds of doubt and God and maybe... And that's why some of the things that you should pay attention to are the things that God has said to you that you don't like. Or the things that you feel God has said to you, but you really don't like. It's great to pay attention to the good, but it's also good to pay attention to the ones that you don't like. Because a lot of times, real and great progress comes in the things that you really don't like in the moment. And it's your posture and your response to it that communicates something to God. If you're wasting time, God says, you're not ready for this. He says, nah, I can't use you, no. You, you don't have the capacity for what I'm talking about here. So sit down. 
and you're there waiting for him to come and just, everybody say, stand up and get going. Take a risk. Let grace hit your wrist. Make a mistake and rise up. Some of you have actually made a mistake. Hey, Mike, could you mind just playing, playing for me? Let me wrap up. It's been about, I told you I'd speak for 45 minutes and it has been 50 minutes. This is not my spirit face. I'm actually thinking of what I was saying. Um, uh, sometimes. Huh? Posture. Mm. Capacity. Powerful words. <laughs> All right, wait, wait. I'll gather, I'll gather, I'll gather, I'll gather. I'll gather. But yeah, I'll say something else and it'll come back to me, okay? But yeah, this is the idea, okay? Sometimes in life, you, you're going to get hit. I was talking about risk. You're going to get hit by something or challenged by something that is beyond your scope of understanding. And I always preach this because I feel this so strong. I have seen it in my life many, many times. God has asked me to take steps that every single thing along the way, they said no. The, I, I, I was telling some people that when I went, you see, I invest in property now. But when I went to the, the first major property thing I went for, the guy who I paid to encourage and teach all of us, he looked me there when I told him my situation. When I told him, I'm a med student, I'm an international, I'm an international student, I do this, I do ministry. He looked at me, he, you know what he said to me? He said, why are you even here? Don't bother. And I thought, do you know, maybe that makes a bit of sense. But like Jeremiah, you know, you know when there's something inside you that even when you try to not bother, it takes a lot to quench that thing that is just uncomfortable in your, your heart. You know that this is not where I need to be. And all you have to do is take a step of faith and be willing to fail for the purpose of Christ. There is no part of the Bible that says when you take a risk every time with God that you're going gonna, gonna to succeed. Because success, according to man, is a different construct to God. And so he says, my ways are not your ways. And so when you think of, so you think that if God said it, it must be successful. But God gives you the end. And you don't see the way and the means and how you're going to go there. And so now, when you start and everything looks against you. And the problem is that God will often tell you to do the thing that everyone around you did a different way. Everyone around you planned it different, and they, they did it different, and they worked it different. And you're like, God, just give, I, I, my way does not work, God, it's proven. But he does it because if he's going to make streams in the desert, someone's going to have to be willing to, to, to dig on behalf of God. And when you're digging a stream in the desert, you're going to look like a fool. Because they're going to say, what are you doing? By nightfall, when the sandstorm comes, it will look like plain. Leave it alone. But God will challenge you to chase the promise above the present. And you must understand this. You cannot share both. Don't think that you can divide your time because you feel like it's possible. With the way you work, you feel like, God, so far what you've told me to do, I can actually work it with the stuff going on now and I can actually, I can merge everything. But the thing about God is God doesn't think like you. You call it free time. God says opportunity. And you think, oh, it's free time. I can now use it to do Ishmael stuff because I don't want to know. I have free time now so I can just do the stuff that I really don't want to let go of just in case. And God is saying, this is not free time for you to do what you want. All time belongs to me. And so your free time is not the time where you explore some things that are not the promise. Your free time has a purpose. It might be sleep. It might be whatever it is. It might be shopping. I wish, I just pray that my free time in this season is just shopping and sleep in Jesus' name. But it might be something that you don't want to do. But it's your willingness to say, God, all time belongs to you. I'm not trying to divide the promise with, what, with what's going on. I know that you've said that this is not it. I don't care how many years I've spent on it, God, it's expired. There have been things in my life that I wanted to see through. 
It's got to be a place somewhere that you, you were so, you, were, you, you, you got visions for the place. You saw dreams. You were ready. You were like, God, I want to see this through till I die. This is me, where I'm going to be. And then three years into it, God is like, thank you very much. I'll keep them. Next. And you're thinking, God, can I just see it through? Can I just see the vision? See, when you have a kingdom perspective, it's not about whether you see it through or Oyen sees it through. It's about the fact that it is seen through. And so whether it's by your hands or by someone else's hands, whether the, the deliverance and the, the, the preaching to your family or the person by the road, or whether it's going to come by your sister or your brother, a kingdom mentality says it doesn't matter who it comes from. God, I would do what you said I would do. And so if you've asked me to shift, I am going to shift, but I am going to keep these people in my prayer that God, their faith will not fail. You see, when it was time for Jesus to go, he, one of the things Jesus said to Peter in his journey, he said to him, he said, Peter, the enemy said that he was going to sift you like wheat. But Jesus said, he said, but Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. There comes a point in life where it's, your time might be up in a physical place, in a physical location. But you can say, God, I, am, I love this. I have passion for it. I am going to push. I will pray. I would love them. When God says leave, it doesn't mean hate them and run away. That's when now we see moving on. And we take it personal. So when someone is working with you and they want to move on, we take it personal. Say you're doing it to me. Kingdom. It's a broader perspective. Get ready for people to come and work in your company and leave. You've got to have a tough skin. Get ready for people to tell you, I am with you till I die. And I'm not saying you should be paranoid. Trust. But get ready for people to leave and know that God will heal you through it. Because now you're living a cautious life. I will only do it when I'm 100% sure that it's going to work out. And God is thinking, Let, walk on water, Peter. It may not carry you. It didn't carry your neighbor. It didn't carry your friends, but walk on it. And when you walk on water, God is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. It's perfect when you're weak. If you're the kind of person that, that lives to avoid weakness, lives to avoid pain, lives to avoid shame, you're doing it wrong. In this life that we live with Christ, Paul said, listen, he said was, to the Galatians, he said he was carrying them like a woman in labor, in childbirth. If you look at what he obviously implies, but that it was a painful thing that was going on. But he had faith that I will see this through and it will work out. And as I conclude... God is good. The last thing I want to say is this, right? That is the last thing. There's something I find very interesting there. When God said, when Sarah said, man, when Sarah said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. She didn't give an explanation of how far. Did you catch it? She didn't say send him a mile away. She said out. But I want you to look at the nature of the person that Abraham is. Abraham could have built a house a couple steps away and said, let him be close enough that if this doesn't work out, I can find my boy. Abraham could have said, listen, I'll cast out the mother but not the son. I'll move out the son to be with the nanny, but let's keep the mom. Let there be a memory of the thing that God said to get rid of. I just can't live without the memory of my past. I can't live. I have worked so hard on this job. God, I need something as an emotional bench. 
to lean on, to live off, God. I want something. Give me something that can be some kind of emotional support. When I don't want the promise, I can go to the past. Abraham woke up early in the morning. And you need to understand, if they were going to the house right beside, he would not have had to give them water and bread. He prepared them for a journey that was far. When they said, cast him and the mother out, he sent them beyond where he could interact with them. He kicked them out. What part of your life do you have a loose grip on? You cast it out, but not so far, and you think you deceive God with your loose grip. You think, you think God doesn't know. You have a, just, a, just a slight, you're not really holding it too tough. You're just kind of like holding it kind of like there. Just like, yeah, I'm going to be doing the main things with my stronger hand. And, the, you know, the, the other stuff, I'm just going to like, just, just in case. And there's a temptation to have a crutch to lean on. There's a temptation. But I want you to know this and keep this in your heart. Whenever God says to you, time's up, cast this out, move on. Don't do it. It's better that you do it too far than you keep it too close. When we look at the Bible, people who kept a loose grip usually fell into it. I've never seen someone who kicked it too far that failed. Never. You see, because the human emotion does not allow you to kick things too far. It is the way you are constructed to keep things that you know closer, just in case. But I'm talking about the reason you were born. If you are going to walk in the thing that you were born to walk in, you cannot have plan B, C, D, E, F, G. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should only have one hit, one addition. All I have is... All... No. Think. You have a mind. Think. Plan. Arrange. But always give an ear to what God is saying. So if he says, listen, this is up. Push it aside. And send it far as possible. So that you can focus without distraction on the reason that you were called. Rise up with me. Cast out this bondwoman and her son. Cast out this bondwoman and her son. I want you to, to look to God in the next few minutes and ask God, Father. Reveal and expose the Ishmael and the Hagar in my life. I know you think you don't have one because you've been doing this a long time. But if you have emotions, Hagar's always around the corner. If you got emotions, Ishmael is always around the corner. Mingling with it now. You may have cast it away. But there's always something that is trying to and say, Father, just reveal this to me. Wherever there's the way I think, the way I assimilate. Expose the Ishmael in my life. I want you to also pray this prayer in addition to that. I want you to realize that Abraham did not even realize that Ishmael was a problem. But, but, but there was a fence around him. People around him that had the foresight over his life, the love for him, to point out there is something here that doesn't need to be here. 
every single person needs a Sarah or two that is willing to confront the thing in your life that should not be there. Come on, ask God, say, Father, that's a two-part prayer. Reveal to me the people that you have sent to me to do life with. And if they're already there, then Father, give me the word for those relationships. I need people that are going to challenge Well done. People that will say, that's nonsense. I don't agree with that. Let's talk on the phone. Come on, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Father, reveal that to me. Yeah. And Father, give me the humility to hear. Give me the humility to heed her voice. And to know around me. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to pray for you. If I go, if I just lift your hands, put your hand in some kind of a receiving position, whatever it is. Father, I just pray for your people. I thank you, Lord, for their lives and the things that you have called them to do. Thank you for, the, for your grace over their lives, Father. Thank you, Father, Lord, for the decisions that they've made thus far. I thank you, Lord, because you have forgiven us for where we have produced Ishmael or where we have produced Hagar or whatever. That was not your will. I thank you, Father Lord, that now you are calling us to cast it out. And so, Father, I release over your people grace to make the decisions that need to be made, to have the conversations that need to be had, to say the things that need to be said. Father Lord, that we will not be proud or afraid to do what you want us to do, Father. But, Father, that we would be willing to do what you have said according to your will, Father. And even now, I just feel that there's someone or some of us here or some people here. It is not that, you see, God has forgiven you for the Ishmael, but you're stuck there. You're too focused in, Father, I made a mistake. Oh, my gosh, I shouldn't have. This is what I did. Look at my life, whatever it is. But God is asking you, shift your focus from the birth and set your eyes on the sending out. It's time to look away from the mistake you made and look to how, according to God's plans, he wants to rectify the issue and bring you back into alignment. And so everyone, move away from condemnation and ask God, God, how do we rectify the issue, the problem? And how can I live in your grace? Bless us, Lord, and let your name be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, come and celebrate Jesus. Take your seat.